Well, we have a lot to get to today. First of all, the stock market's in the red slightly, despite a huge blowout in the jobs number. This is a highly anticipated number because it shows what the U.S. economy just did in the previous month. And in July, the U.S. added 528,000 jobs. Now, without context, that may not sound that impressive, but the expectations, the forecasts, were for roughly half this amount. So this was a massive blowout. I want to go into this number further, into the unemployment rate, into default rates to try to paint what is more of an accurate picture of how the U.S. economy is doing. We also have news that Amazon went on an additional shopping spree. Amazon continues to buy things left and right. They bought a medical company just like two weeks ago, and now they're buying iRobot, the maker of the Roomba, the little vacuum that goes around and bumps into things and your dog plays with it and your kids sit on top of it. That vacuum, Amazon just bought it for $1.7 billion to expand their ever-growing profile of in-house items. And I want to go over this as someone that's a huge Amazon bull. I actually own this company in a growth portfolio. I have studied this company as much as any other company that I own. And I wanna go over how I think this will fit into their overall strategy. Now, in addition to that, we also have a company that's struggling right now. It's called Warner Brother Discovery. It's the combination of HBO and HBO Max and Discovery with their reality shows, all trying to be put together into one service. And this company just posted a horrific earnings report really bad. It's down 15.8% on the day. And some of the numbers in this report were just staggering. Like this net income looks a little bit different than the previous months. So we're going to be going over Warner Brothers Discovery and trying to piece together what's going on with this company. So as always, we have a lot to jump into in this episode. If you haven't already, make sure to like the video, subscribe to the channel. That helps boost it out and show it to other people. Now, I also do something in addition to going over the news. I track my own portfolio. It's called the passive income account. The reason that I track this publicly is because I feel like there's not a lot of transparency in finance in general. And when there's not transparency and people don't share and discuss things, they become a little bit more ignorant to it. So by showing what's going on with my portfolio, how I perform, my wins and my losses, I feel like that could potentially help out other people. What I do with this portfolio is invest in high quality dividend paying companies that I consider to be more than just dividend payers, I consider them to be compounders, which means they have resilience. I can rely on them to earn growing amounts of money in almost any market environment. And this has been put through the test over the past six months. We just had earnings season and I recorded the amount of companies that I had in my portfolio and which ones beat their earnings and gave strong forecasts of the future, and which ones missed their earnings or gave weak forecasts. Around 71% of my portfolio beat their revenue and their earnings projections and gave very strong forecasts. It would have been around 80% but Microsoft missed on their earnings and revenue, but they did give strong forecasts. So we're actually doing better than the rest of the market in terms of this earnings season. We still have a couple outliers though, a couple companies that haven't reported yet, Disney and Target. So we'll see how they do August 10th and August 17th. But overall, I focus on compounders, I focus on dividend payers and companies that can grow their earnings, grow their revenue, grow their dividend over a long period of time. And I've been trying to reshape and reforge my portfolio to be as strong as possible going forward. There's one tool that I use from time to time that I developed called the Dip Finder. This is part of Qualtrum. It's available to all Patreon members. And it shows you how my companies are trading or how any companies that you're following are trading at any given time. This is a technical way of looking at it called the price versus the 200 day simple moving average, which it technically shows the price momentum of a stock, how it's trading compared to the previous 200 days. And as you can see, there's some companies that over the past 200 days are way underneath their average target, which got crushed with extra inventory, having to slash the cost of different items, having to make room for the back to school sales. This company's down big year to date. It's down around 30%. Luckily, it's a very small holding of mine. JP Morgan and T. Rowe Price are two other companies that the price momentum has moved sharply in a negative direction. And that's a given. These companies are cyclicals, they're financials, and they're moving down in preparation for the big recession that we're having, right? The big recession coming up. Then on the other end of the spectrum, we have Vici. This is one of my largest holdings right next to Apple and Microsoft. 
and it's moved up 16% above its 200-day moving average. VG's performance has been nothing short of spectacular. The company's up 14% year-to-date, not counting the hefty dividend that it pays. Another company that I'll mention that I think is outperforming expectations to a large extent is Texas Roadhouse. Who would have thought that a restaurant company in 2022 would do this well? The company is facing all sorts of problems with inflation, commodity prices, height and labor, and we're projected to go into a recession. Or by many people's estimates, we're already in a recession. But yet, despite all of that, a restaurant company, a casual dining restaurant, is moving in a positive territory. It has positive price momentum. Texas Roadhouse has been performing really well, both in terms of price and fundamentals. The company is 0% year to date which doesn't sound great unless you compare it to the S&P 500, which is down 15%, or the QQQ, which is down even more. So overall, around half of the companies in my portfolio have very positive price momentum, half are currently in a dip, but overall the earnings are very strong. 71% of them forecasted very strong quarters next quarter. So I feel comfortable moving forward in the way that I'm invested and not paying attention to short-term fluctuations. Now, if you wanna see every single one of these categories and the companies in them, there's a link called Dividend Portfolio in the description below. Now, moving on, the big news of the day is the economic news. The US added 528,000 jobs in July. Payroll returned to pandemic levels, unemployment rate, fell to 3.5%. So this is what this chart looks like here with the recovery in the jobs. This has been a very rapid recovery in job gains over the past couple of years, faster than since post-World War II. So it has been an incredibly fast recovery. They say the unemployment rate now is down to 3.5%. We added 528,000 jobs, which puts us just above pre-pandemic levels. So we finally went back to before pre-pandemic levels. Now, of course, this isn't that trend, but it's much better than expected. And if you don't compare this against the forecasts and the analysis and expectations, it doesn't give it proper context. But this is what this last month looked like compared to forecasts. The actual estimates going into this month is that we were going to gain 250,000 jobs. So we roughly doubled that. 528,000 versus 250,000. This absolutely blew away the forecasts and estimates from the economists and forecasters. And where did these jobs come from? The jobs gains were widespread last month. Employers in leisure and hospitality added jobs at a solid clip as restaurant and bars continue to recover. Payrolls also grew in healthcare and professional and business services, which included many white collar jobs. So I see this shift in where the jobs are at right now. I'm seeing a lot of tech companies actually do layoffs. Some are still hiring, but many companies like Robinhood, uh, many of these big tech companies are slowing down their hiring or they're doing layoffs. Meanwhile, leisure and hospitality, healthcare are doing a lot of hiring right now. So jobs are being lost in some areas, but more hiring is going on in most cases. This is why economic data is so difficult. And this is why economists aren't filthy rich by being able to easily predict the economy and the stock market. A lot of this data is incredibly difficult to piece together. We have a job market where we gained nearly double what the estimates are. That's a good thing. We have unemployment to almost record lows, 3.5%. That's also a good thing. We have less people choosing to work, which is arguably a bad thing. And we have two consecutive quarters of GDP decline, which is objectively a bad thing. So you can try to make sense of all of this, but I just don't think it's helpful in terms of investing. I would never base my investments off of what the economy has done or what I think it's going to do. I base it off of individual security analysis with my companies and how I think their earnings will grow over the next five years. Predicting the economy, I think is a losing game. I don't think people are gonna be able to do that accurately. And while I think this report is good, it doesn't really say a lot of whether or not we're in a recession, we're going into recession, if we are, how bad it will be, and even if we are, and you can accurately predict that, what it will do to the stock market. Trying to predict all of those variables, I think is literally impossible. Now moving on, we have some big news that Amazon's picking up yet another acquisition. They just bought a healthcare company a couple weeks ago. Now they're buying iRobot, the maker of Roomba, for $1.7 billion. Now, this seems like an easy acquisition for Amazon. I think this will go through just fine, but I wanna go into how I think this will play in their overall strategy. The official statement here from Amazon's hardware device chief is, quote, over many years, the iRobot team has proven its ability to reinvent how people clean with products that are incredibly practical 
and inventive, from cleaning when and where customers want while avoiding common obstacles in the home, to automatically emptying and collecting bins. Customers love iRobot products, and I'm excited to work with the iRobot team to invent in ways that make customers' lives easier and more enjoyable. Now, if we dive into this a little deeper, we can see the type of products that iRobot has. They have a lot of these little pod robots that drive around your home and try to clean. And they've actually gotten better and better. The first iterations of these were very dumb and very clumsy. They would go over almost anything, they'd get stuck all the time, they had no way of mapping out locations in your home, and now the most recent iterations of them have become increasingly complex, sophisticated, and overall a much better tool. I have one of the newer Roombas and they're pretty smart at this point. They actually do a very good job of cleaning where they should clean, sticking to certain parts of the house with no physical barriers, and they avoid most of the obstacles of toys and things left on the floor. In terms of capability, market share, and brand name, iRobot is by far the biggest player in this industry. They own the robot cleaning category. So Amazon just went for the biggest, the most well-known, and by far the best in the category. iRobot is the leader here. The latest iterations of these robots actually do a physical map of your home. You don't have to map it out, the robot does it for you. The first time it goes around, it bumps around to the outside of the walls, and then it knows specifically where it is relative to the rest of your home. So you can command the robot to go to a specific room down a hallway or to different parts of your home and it will find its way there and only work in that specific room. So Amazon's now going to have maps of literally millions of people's homes, which is an interesting thought. They're going to be able to map out people's houses and their floor plans. Amazon will be able to gather a lot of data from this company and help integrate that into their other offerings and further integrate it into their ecosystem. And I think overall that is the end game here. It's the ecosystem. Big tech companies love their ecosystem. All of them have one. Apple has, I believe, the strongest ecosystem, but Amazon has a pretty strong one as well. And it's part of their Alexa smart home ecosystem. We all know the speakers, but they also are doing this with TVs, with the fire TVs and the fire sticks, with their cameras, with their lighting, with the smart thermostats, and now with your vacuum products. That's gonna be part of this ecosystem. So I think this is one more move of Amazon to expand their ecosystem and smart products and make all of these work together. If they can make all of this stuff work unified, it gives people more incentive to buy something already in this ecosystem than something outside of it. Now, looking at the fundamentals of this company as an individual company or individual stock, because iRobot is a publicly traded company, it doesn't look very strong. It's a weak company overall because it's a newer one, and its goal is to grow revenue, which is what they've done. They've grown their revenue around triple since 2014. The other metrics are so-so, not the strongest company, but that's not why Amazon's purchasing it. They're doing it for strategic reasons to include it as part of their vast ecosystem offering. So I think this is a great acquisition for Amazon. It's not an overly expensive company. It's one that's growing quickly. They have high quality products that I think people will continue to purchase and it will expand Amazon's ecosystem because you know you're gonna be able to control these robots with your Alexa device and Amazon's gonna iterate and incorporate different integrated features. Now moving on, I have to talk about Warner Bros. Discovery. This is a stock I'm asked about frequently, and they just reported their Q2 earnings, which were a bit messy, to say the least. It's down 15% after the earnings report because of big problems they're facing. So before we jump into this, I just have to give a quick shout out to today's sponsor of this video, which is FTX US. There's a link in the pinned comment of this video. You can sign up now, and if you do, use the referrer code Carlson, because when you create your brokerage account and use the referrer code Carlson, when you do your first $100 trade, it'll credit you $10. Now with this, you can trade anytime the market's open. You can buy and sell using fractional shares. It's part of FINRA and SIPC insured, and they are adding more and more features to it every single day. So try it out now and let me know what you think. Warner Brothers Discovery, they just reported their earnings and it was very messy. They say that they wrote a big loss on content and merger costs. And Zaslav here, he was the guy that was supposed to make this business great. And so far, what he's done on this most recent earnings call is blame the previous management and the previous estimates. He threw all of the blame onto everyone else and what they did setting this whole thing up. 
He's saying, this isn't my fault. This is a problem with the estimates beforehand. Now I have the actual earnings report here and I just wanna highlight a couple things on it. First of all, their total revenue decreased by 1% taking out foreign exchange. So they had a revenue decline. The net loss available to Warner Brothers Discovery was 3.418 billion. 3 billion 418 million dollars of a net loss. That includes a 2 billion dollar amortization of intangibles, a 1 billion dollar restructuring and other charges and 983 million of transaction and integration expenses. Lots of expenses added in a single quarter causing this company to have a massive net loss. To give this a visual of how bad this actually looks, we can take a look at this on the chart here. If I pull this up, just take a look at how bad this loss is this quarter. $3.4 billion of net income loss in a single quarter. And the biggest problem they're finding now, which seems to be a surprise for this company, is free cash flow problems. The cash provided by operating activities increased to 1 billion and reported free cash flow increased to 789 million. So they're saying, look, we have free cash flow, 789 million. And the impression this type of writing leaves to investors is that they're highly free cash flow productive. And that's not really the case. Because when you're looking at free cash flow, you have to consider what is creating those free cash flows. Is it actual money being taken in from the company or is it just dilution? And the problem with saying that they made all of this free cash flow last quarter is it doesn't incorporate the amount of shares outstanding. The shares outstanding went from, in 2021, 589 million to 2.286 billion. So they 4X the amount of shares outstanding. This is where the free cash flow came from. We can even see this more clear on Qualtrum. For example, if we pull up the shares outstanding graph, you can see the dramatic increase in shares, it going up by roughly four times the amount. And then if we pull up the free cash flow graph here, this is what they're saying they're doing so great. Look everyone, we made a lot of free cash flow last quarter. It's right there in line with previous quarters. That's not really accurate because if we filter this by the amount of free cash flow on a per share basis, it's down to 35 cents, which is much lower than previous quarters. It was a decline from the most recent quarter and comparative to the history of the company, it's nothing spectacular. So that's the biggest problem I see. This company's facing cash flow problems. And in the meantime, they have large outstanding amounts of debt. And people like to talk about how much debt Netflix has. Take a look at Warner Brothers Discovery's debt chart. It went from 13.6 billion two quarters ago to the most recent quarter being 51.39 billion. Let's go ahead and compare this to Netflix. Netflix was talked about as a company that's highly indebted. Netflix has way more cash with $5.8 billion in cash and they only have $14.23 billion in debt. So they have roughly a third to a fourth the amount of debt that Warner Brothers Discovery has. So Warner Brothers Discovery is facing worse cash flow issues than projected on top of very high fixed costs with their large amounts of debt. And Rich Greenfield tries to explain how this is working out for them. I think in this case, a little bit of this is sort of like that movie Apollo 13, right? Where like, you know, Houston, we've had a problem. And I think if you're Zaslav right now, you're going, you know, you're looking at AT&T and you sort of have like, oh my God, I can't believe I bought based on these projections. I mean, John Stanky at AT&T looks like a genius because Discovery is now, Warner Brothers Discovery is now blaming sort of the AT&T projections as unreliable, not to mention the overall macroeconomic environment. And so what they're effectively doing, Joe, is they're scrambling to figure out because cash flow is coming in far below expectations. They've got a lot of debt. So they're sort of finding new ways to generate dollars. You mentioned an ad-supported streaming service, something maybe like a Pluto uh, or a 2B TV. They're probably looking at doing a very big licensing deal with Amazon and going back into Amazon channels, something we talked about why they left Amazon channels on CNBC probably nine months ago. All of this is true. They're looking at potentially having an ad-supported tear. They're also looking at partnering with Amazon to have it included with Amazon because Amazon can get customers and drive traffic to HBO. Another word I would exchange from looking is scrambling. Warner Brothers Discovery is scrambling right now. They're scrambling for options to solve a big problem they have, which is no clear direction and strategy. They're looking at licensing catalog to Netflix and Amazon. Like they're just looking at how do they find dollars 
any way possible right now because they're coming in with a $2 billion shortfall in 2023 EBITDA versus what they thought back in February. So I think that's driving a lot of the changes that you heard about last night. HBO Max and Discovery Plus create a massive combined library. And the strategy right now is to somehow combine these two companies together into one service, which would require a rebranding. There are people talking about them potentially losing the HBO Max branding, which I think would be a mistake given how much they've tried to work to create this brand. If I was going to combine Discovery Plus with HBO Max, I would just make it HBO Max and have Discovery be part of it. I think people would learn that over time because I think the HBO Max brand is more powerful than Discovery. It has more subscribers. It's a bigger known brand. They spent an enormous amount marketing it and growing that brand. And I think it would be a mistake to ditch it. So right now, their official plan is to combine these services together to rebrand it somehow. We don't have clarity into what that's going to mean. And then to try to grow it to 130 million paying subscribers by 2025 in this highly competitive market. So my opinion, when I compare Warner Brothers Discovery to Disney and Netflix, I like Disney and Netflix more, and for a couple reasons. One of them is I think that Warner Brothers Discovery is in a state of panic, they're in a state of disarray, they're trying to piece together a strategy on the fly. And I don't like investing in companies that don't have a very clear strategy that's been thought out in a highly competitive market like this one. I think they're in a very dangerous situation to be in. And as good as their content is, with all of these great assets like Discovery Plus and the Warner Media assets, it still has a cost to it. Those assets cost a lot. They have an enormous amount of debt. That's not a great thing to have on the balance sheet when you don't have a very clean strategy going forward. Right now, I'd rather own Disney or Netflix or even Paramount+. Plus. That's all the news for now. I hope you enjoyed the episode. If you did, make sure to subscribe to the channel with the bell notification on, and I'll see you in the next one.